This is the English Suite Podcast, the voice of Widener University English and Creative Writing, hosted by Jim Esch. In this series, we celebrate English language literature and creative writing, and the impact that both have had on the human experience. In today's show, Jim talks about flash fiction with Dr. Michael Cacharel. You will hear original work by Michael and a creative nonfiction flash piece by undergraduate student Shaprisa Yimurai. Michael Cacharel is Associate Professor of English and Creative Writing at Widener University, where he teaches courses in American literature, fiction writing, and composition. He is the author of two collections of short fiction titled Still Time and Here is Where, Stories. His first novel, None of the Above, was published by Unsolicited Press in February 2019. He has co-edited several collections of scholarly essays, including most recently, Critical Insights, Flash Fiction. For more about Michael, visit him at michaelcacharel.wordpress.com. Michael Kasharal, my colleague and friend, welcome to the English Suite. Ah, thank you, Jim. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, you become an expert in this type of fiction, known as flash fiction, both as a scholar and as a practitioner of the art. So, but a lot of people in our audience might not know what this is. So, for the uninitiated, what exactly is flash fiction? Yeah. Um, Flash fiction, um, when, when we talk about flash fiction, we're talking about um, works that are usually less than a thousand words. Um, and uh, so, so they're very brief stories. Uh, and the idea for the writer is to see um, what, that, um, what that compression can, uh, you know, can, can yield. Um, there, are, there are lots of different things that happen to a story when they, um, uh, when when you have so few words to deal with, so there are lots of other um, also uh, uh, subgenres under flash fiction like microfiction and drabbles and um, hint fiction, and you know with each of these the word count gets lower and lower. Um, you know there's almost kind of a literary limbo that's uh, performed. When when did flash fiction become a term of art? Like when is what's the history of it? Flash fiction, the, the name that is used today um, uh, goes back to the early 90s. There was, a, there was a volume of flash fiction published by that name, uh, but um, flash fiction has antecedents. Well before that, um, you know, we go back to Hemingway uh, and um, some of the works uh, in, his, uh, in, our, in Our Time from 1925, his first uh, collection of uh, Nick Adams stories. And then we go back even further to, uh, you know, Kate Chopin uh, and some of her very brief works like A Story, uh, Story of an Hour, uh, the frequently anthologized um, story. At, those, at that time, those stories were not known as flash fiction, but there has been this tradition of very brief um, works of, uh, of literature going back as far as the, the Bible, back, back to Aesop's fables um, as, as well. Yeah, I remember when I was kind of coming of age in the 70s and 80s, we, we used to call them short shorts. Mm -hmm. And that term went out of style, I think, with with hot pants and tube tops. <laughs> <laughs> you don't hear short shorts too much anymore. But right. I, like, I like flash fiction better. It's a, it's a nicer name. Yeah, yeah. Sh short shorts, there, there was... Um, uh, in the, like the 30s and the 40s um, and 50s, there were magazines that would publish um, these, you know, precursors to flash fiction, and, and they went by the name of short shorts, and there are all kinds of contests. Um, but yes, flash fiction is an improvement over that name. So how did you get into this form yourself as a creative writer? Like what, what drew you to it? And do you want to tell that story? Yeah, um, I think... I began writing flash fiction um, probably in the early to mid, um, maybe like 2005 or something, something along those lines. Um, and I, it, it came about really by necessity. Um, shorter works were easier to draft and revise and complete in the midst of 
um, you know, a, a heavy teaching load. And so, but after that, I became fascinated by the challenge of trying to accomplish a lot in a small space. So given those limitations, you know, what, you know, what, what, what could I do? What, what kind of surprises could I create for the reader, for myself? And so what really attracted me to flash fiction was the possibility of experimentation because um, it was really a low risk proposition. You know, you can experiment if it doesn't come out the way you like it. Um, you know, you, you can always go on to another short uh, piece. Um, and it was also a high reward because you never knew, you know, what you're going to find. Sometimes you strike gold and, um, you know, you, you love a piece and it's kind of taking your writing in a new surprising uh, direction. So that's, that's what really kind of got the ball rolling for me. And do you find yourself when you write, I know you've written a lot of short stories. Is, is this like your main, your main gig now when you write short fiction, do you tend to do flash more often than like a full length short story? Yeah, I think um, in the last year, especially, um, I, I, you know, I trace it back to the beginning of the pandemic. I, I started writing um, these drabbles, uh, which are 100 word fictions, and they have to be 100 words uh, exactly. That's the definition of a drabble. And so I said, OK, um, that that that's a particular challenge. Let me try that. And I started writing one and one led to another. And I found that, you know, probably because I felt myself confined um, by, by the pandemic. I thought, well, let me try um, to confine myself in my writing as well and, and, um, uh, and, and um, see what I could do within those um, restrictions. And so over the last year, I've written about um, maybe 90 pieces um, that are 100 words, 200 words, or, or, or 300 words. Some of them have not turned out quite so well um some of them you know i'm quite happy with and there are a lot in the middle at this point did you say 90 90 90 yeah yeah wow <laughs> <laughs> i'm impressed <laughs> but once you once you get on a roll they're like um you know potato chips you, you can't you can't eat but one right like i i wonder if you could maybe share uh, one of these and then we'll maybe we'll talk a little bit more but um do you have any travels you, you want to read yeah, um, I've got a couple that um, I wrote within the last year, and um, they have been published. So the, this this first one, um, you know, makes a lot of sense um, to read to begin, given what we are going through and what we've been going through the last year. It's called Quarantine, and it was published in a local a journal called Avunke Siamo. And uh, I'll just read it here. It's 100 words. When watching windows grew old, they tried many new things, recipes, languages, positions. One morning, a friend texted, soap cutting videos. After breakfast, they took laptop and bottle to bed. He clicked play and they watched the blade slide, soap pebbles like cereal spilling down in its wake. Occasionally, they sipped champagne. Neither said a word. After, she sighed. Another? He stared at blinds. She felt across his body for play. He wanted to say there was tomorrow, the next and the next. They should spread out the fun, a pat of butter over a long, dark slice of toast. Nice. Uh, so tell us a little bit about where this one came from and how, how do you kind of tell a story in 100 words? A lot of times when I write stories and I go back and I try to think, well, where did this story come from? I just cannot put together um, any kind of coherent narrative. But with this one, the story began with my daughter's fascination with um, soap um, carving or soap cutting videos. And, and these are these um, videos that are all over YouTube and um, they, they're, they run of different lengths and, and they just show people um, you know, cutting uh, soap, and and they're pre-cut too. So when um, when the blade swipes over uh, the surface of the soap, they the little little bits of the soap just kind of fall all over the place, and they kind of plunk down onto the floor. So so that's what I was thinking of with the soap pebbles, like uh, cereal spilling down. So that 
I, I felt like I had to had to write about that um, in some way. And um, of course, I was you know feeling very constrained and, and constricted by um, you know doing the social distancing, especially the severe form of that that we did back in March and April. And also the the kind of um, uh, sense of not knowing when this would end. And so I wanted to just somehow convey that. I, I think with a lot of flash fiction, the best way to close or to conclude a piece is by focusing on an image that um, suggests uh, a state of mind of the character. And that's why I thought the character should be thinking of um, the future like a long piece of toast. So I don't know that comes out as a coherent uh, um, you know narrative of, of, of how I wrote the story but um, but that's those are the things I was thinking about yeah um, do you have do you have another one to share sure so this one's a little bit um, different and I guess the initial inspiration for this one which is called the long arc of history is that is that phrase or that idea that the arc of history you know bends towards justice and so this was a piece that was um, published in unlikely stories mark Five. It was published last fall. And uh, the title just kind of bleeds right into the piece itself. So um, I'll read the title and then just go on with the story. The long arc of history is actually a hose, bent, kinked, spun up like a snake. All you want to do is undo the mess enough to stretch the nozzle to your puny garden, where fruit drops dead on brittle earth. People shout from windows, a weapon, call the cops. You plead for help, pull, untwist, slip nozzle through endless coils. It leaks from here and there, water strikes full in your face. Justice roars the mob. You go under, world, a sea mean swirl. That night, the vigil over, someone sneaks out to wrench the spigot right. After the fact, kindness, sure but not an answer, nor even consolation. Hmm. So uh, this one th reads very differently than the, the, the first one you read, yeah. I think. So again, I, I think I was just responding to that idea of the long arc of history uh, bends towards justice, which, um, which I sometimes find um, hard to you know, believe. Uh, and so I, I thought, well, okay, wh wh you know, what else, uh, what else could I do with that? And so instead of, instead of making it an arc, um, I just kind of changed the terms a little bit and said, well, no, it's a hose and it's all kind of screwed up. And, and, and this, this poor person is, is trying to, you know, uh, straighten it out, but, um, but there's all of this um, uh, chaos uh, around him. And so this piece does read differently. Um, it's more, I guess, uh, like a parable, per perhaps. It almost has an absurdist element, on yeah. kind of like it, it kind of gets starts to get out of hand, you know, when the, the mob is roaring. And right. uh, of course, that doesn't seem so unrealistic anymore, like after January 6th. Exactly, yeah, yeah. when you're when you're writing something this this short um you know you just sometimes you just kind of go with it and you and you turn off you turn off your brain um temporarily and just say all right well i'll, I'll get this out and I'll, I'll worry about figuring out the you know quote unquote sense behind it later and when you do that it allows you to go places where you wouldn't normally go and so i so, so I, I like that it, it, it's, it's kind of exciting um, because if you do wind up spinning out of control, then at least you're just dealing with 100 words that you have to kind of get into some kind of order. When you compose these drabbles, do you, are you keeping an eye on the word count or do you kind of like write a little bit long and then pare it back? Yeah, uh, some, sometimes, sometimes I have a sense 
right off the bat of roughly how, how long it's going to be. Um, but there, there have been a number of instances where I have something that is either a hundred words or 200 words. And I want to, I want to get it exactly. Um, and then when I write a draft, I have something like, you know, 130 words. And I think to myself, okay, how am I going to get rid of, you know, 30 words? And, you know, initially I think it's in, in, impossible, but the more I think about it, the more I, you know, kind of worry over it, um, you know, I, I, I find a way to get down there. Uh, and then on other occasions, I write out a draft of something and then I, I do the, you know, the word count and I find out I'm right, right around a hundred um, or right around 200, which suggests that, you know, because I've been maybe writing so many of these, I, I kind of instinctively feel, you know, when, when, I, when I've got to the limit. When you when you you drafted so many of these, like where do they start from um, prompts or like where are you getting your, your your starting points from? Like, do you how do how does like and how do you say like okay, this is now going to be a drabble versus a, a longer story? Yeah, um, sometimes you know, as as far as the second question is concerned, sometimes I'm I'm not sure at the outset, you know what what it's going to look like. Um, there, there have been occasions where I have started out something that I thought was going to be, you know, relatively brief and it turned out to be a full fledged short story or, or even something, you know, kind of approaching novella length. I just kind of wound up, you know, you know, growing the story more and more. It just felt like it needed to go in that direction. As far as inspiration, I usually don't write from um, prompts. Um, so I guess the prompt that are just from situations, uh, that, you know, or, or, or things that I'm thinking about. Um, but, um, but I know some people respond wonderfully to, to, to prompts. It's, it's just something that I usually don't do. And you've, I know you've, you've written about flash, uh, in your scholarship, like, is it, do you um how how much of this feeds into your teaching I know, I know you teach a lot of flash fiction too like and i'm just kind of curious as to um how teaching flash fiction goes over with the students and how you know how do they respond to it and do you find it it's a maybe a a better approach to teaching fiction than some other ways you might teach fiction yeah, I think um, the students really, um, really enjoy it. And I think they enjoy it for a lot of the reasons I enjoy it because um, it's, it's manageable and it's a, it's such a um, pliable form. Um, you can experiment. And if you, if something doesn't turn out how you like it, you can go on. Um, I think students also like it because they can do, um, Speaking of experimentation, you know they they can they can do various um, that they can use different forms and um, and tell a story in a, in in a different form. Like for example, um, through a list, or they could um, you know write um, write a flash fiction as a series of directions. And so so they like appropriating different forms um, and 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 trying to use those forms to, uh, to tell a story in an unconventional way. Uh, do you have maybe one more to read? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Why don't I read this one that was published in uh, Fiction Kitchen uh, Berlin uh, this past fall? Uh, the Fiction Kitchen Berlin is a is a great um, uh, journal um, uh, out of out of Berlin in Germany. I love um, the title. <laughs> yeah, it's great. The name of this piece is Way to Go. This, speaking of, um, you were asking a question about prompts before. Um, I guess this counts as a prompt. I was reading an article um, about a discovery that was made um, about two insects that had been preserved in amber, and they were engaged in the sexual act. And to me, that was, was very fascinating. And so, um, so I, I read that article, and... Uh, this story kind of um, grew up from that. The name of the story is Way to Go. When notified of their impending demise, the couple deleted the forms. Who didn't 
in those early incredulous days. Undaunted, the easement sent symptoms, fever, chills, piercing pains. Then options, shivering, costly meds nearly gone, the couple scrolled, cliff, lava, ocean, amber. Amber, wife croaked, that story in the news. Two prehistoric flies caught in the act forever. Husband laughed, his thin cage rattling. Our final act of resistance. Porno, cough, for posterity. The finisher, polite, unassuming, came to install all the equipment. Sober now, the couple disrobed, climbed into bed. What you'll find is smooth, the finisher explained. Close your eyes, imagine honey. The dispenser zoomed to a point above the bed. Husband turned, craned, saw the first drop form upon its round metallic lips. He watched it fall, felt the warm, gorgeous splash on the small of his back. They kissed, coughed hard. When the finisher said, go, husband eased inside. Wife's thin legs strained for the ceiling. The second drop landed. She whispered, bye. Laughing, crying, he buried his face into her neck. Lovely, the finisher declared. Hold it there. Drop three. Wow, this is the first. On behalf of the easement, I thank you for your service. Cool. This is really wild stuff. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> like the the finisher and the easement. Like it it this I th I don't have you know I've I've read a lot of your other work before you, you I've always associated with you more more with a, like a realist vein and it seems like you're going into new territory with these kinds of fictions is that fair to say Yeah I think um exactly um there's something so um wonderful about flash in that you know the constriction forces you into directions that you wouldn't you wouldn't normally go in you know i wouldn't you know i guess i would be more concerned about trying to carry this out over the course of a you know 15 or 20 page story and maybe maybe i wouldn't have the courage to do that but but within within 200 words um you know anything goes and that that's that's one of the things that i'm enjoying discovering about about flash fiction and the, the challenge with this one was how do you how do you create a dystopic world um, in 200 words? You know, you, you can't do a lot of world building. And so I, I tried to just kind of hint at it and then just, you know, you know, give this person a name, the finisher, um, give this organization or this government or whatever it is, you know, a name, the easement, um, and just let the reader kind of um, build in the world um, around you know, around those those key details. Have you had any other influences on your on your flash fiction writing style? Um, you mean sp uh, specific authors? Yeah, authors yeah. or teachers or. Yeah, I, I would say as far as um, sp specific writers, um, the, the the writers who kind of create um, completely distinct worlds or, or have or have this completely different style than 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 you're used to reading and and so to enter their their world is to enter um it's it's not just it's not it's not just reading um it, it, it's entering another world so people like um you know lydia davis um uh, diane williams um th those two you know um writers um in particular are, are just so so different um in so many ways um 
and Amelia Gray um, had had a volume that I that I've taught before that is filled full of wild stories that maybe it's helped you know open up my own fiction. Um, uh, the name of that volume is called Gutshot. Um, she's a she's a fantastic writer, and she just um, you know when when she gets going, she just kind of lets it rip. <laughs> you know, she's from the lets it rip uh, you know uh, school of uh, flash fiction, uh, and I really love it. Is there a good market for flash fiction out there? Like, how is this playing out in the publishing world? Is it a popular genre? Yes, it's 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 quite popular. Um, there, you know, almost any um, online and and you know print journals uh, are going to be receptive to um, flash fiction, uh, especially online journals because it's um, it, it's kind of ready made for uh, reading on the screen. So I mentioned a couple of, you know, journals like, you know, Fiction Kitchen Berlin um, is publishing great stuff. Fictive Dream is, is, a, is a journal out of the UK, which um, has published me before, uh, and, and they publish great stuff. Probably the gold standard for flash fiction is Smoke Long Quarterly. You know, Vestal Review is another one. New Flash Fiction Review. Uh, there are even um, journals out there that are specifically devoted to uh, Drabbles. So there's one uh, that's published by um, Grant Faulkner. Um, it's called the 100 Word Story. And so all the words, are, all the stories are 100 words exactly. So yeah, there are plenty of venues out there and um, uh, publishers are, are quite hungry uh, for flash fiction. One thing I like to do with the guests on the show is to ask you what you've been reading lately. What's on your bookshelf or by the nightstand that uh, has been some good reads that you might want to recommend? Yeah, so um, as far as um, flash fiction, um, I've been reading, yeah, I just, uh, there's, a, there's a new book now by uh, Robert uh, Scudalero um, called What Are the Chances? Um, and he's, uh, he's really um, a great flash writer and he's, he's been at it, um, you know, quite a while and I, and I enjoy the humor um, and also the just the in, inventiveness, the the situations that he you know presents uh, for his characters. Um, I just think he's really um, really quite inventive. And then let's see. I also um, a couple of um, uh, volumes that I'm I'm interested in. These are kind of novellas or novels in Flash. So they they are collections of flash fiction but unlike the what are the chances book that i was just talking about these these two are books that are comprised of individual flash pieces but they build to form a novelistic whole trisha bauer um, has a a book called father flashes and it's all about her kind of coming to terms and dealing with her father who is suffering from dementia and then uh, nod gosh um, as a volume called The Crazed Wind, which is a, a daughter kind of um, uh, coming to terms with, you know, her, her father, whom she's had a difficult relationship with. And so, so those two books are uh, what would, you know, what would be called novellas in Flash. And I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in the way in which individual Flashes can be connected together to form a greater whole. So, Michael, thanks so much for sharing your fiction and your perspectives on flash fiction. You really got me excited about this form again. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. So we have a special guest on the podcast, one of my former students from last semester in the advanced fiction writing class, uh, Spressa Yimurai. Spressa is a Albanian American writer and one of our undergraduate students here at Widener. Spressa, I think you think see yourself more as a poet than a prose writer. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is fair. Although I am an aspiring writer, I, I do want to at some point. Yes, and explore. I, I enjoyed the prose that you wrote in the advanced fiction class. It was very. Um, very lyrical and descriptive and uh, I think all the students appreciated the way you read your work and before I have you read a, a, a sample story that you wrote 
tell me how you first learned about flash fiction and is this and what attracted you to this form first of all thank you so much for having me um I took a class with Dr. Pobo in Flash Nonfiction last year, and uh, it just happened that the genre is something that I've explored unknowingly. I've written a lot of fragments, prose or poetry fragments before and throughout my whole life. This is how I've started to write poetry um, from a base of prose, a lyrical prose mostly, which I end up then um, editing and you know forming in a way that um it takes a flow as a poem from that point on so you see a, an affinity between flash fiction and poetry that's very comfortable for you yes i do yeah so t can you tell us a little bit about this piece you're about to read like where how it how it arose did it come from an assignment or something Yes, this was um, an assignment in, again, in Dr. Pobo's class. And it's something that happened roughly in 2009, I think, an accident I was involved in, which didn't involve anybody else, just me in a car. I was driving and it was raining. And um, I, I don't speak of what um, this is, why this piece um, was so evocative for me and, and important for me to write about but I, I i hope it's there and um it will come out and uh, what's it called it's titled i i titled it restored in faith because um there's a moment where loss and grieving gets restored in that moment in that challenging moment where um i actually faced death in that accident, I, I thought that I wasn't going to make it. Okay, let's hear um, Spressa read Restored in Faith. Driving south on Route 95, after sending my kids to school and daycare, on the far right lane, an early morning I savor the sweet and tart aftertaste of my mother's undressed plain donuts. I remember she used to sugarcoat them and rarely drizzle with honey. We'll sleep over the ice glazed road and the sky begins to lower an ashen cloud from which emerges a herd of white-tailed deer charging at me. I meet briefly with fear in, the, in their waterfall eyes and hear their trot fastening over the hood and the roof, falling on the ice sheet melting behind. The heavy current of the morning traffic flows ahead solemnly. The radio is barely on in the background. I listen to the rain sound surging from the lively and still surfaces it meets. I accelerate through the flood without knowing how deep of a bottle I've entered, and I lose control. The car spins twice a deadly dance, shifting three lanes over to the left, ending with a loud slam against the highway's concrete divider facing the dense, fast-moving, oncoming traffic. I hear myself think, now I will see my brother again. But the cars and tracks slow down, passing me. Looking back on the accident, I do not think of death, nor being afraid of it. Surprisingly, I wasn't. I remember turning the car back on, taking the first exit, parking on the side of the road, then taking a taxi to work. When I returned home, what had happened sounded so surreal to everyone, I stopped talking about it. Trapped in the forefront of my thoughts repeats the impression of the words I hear myself say, like air bubbles trapped in crystal dome paperweight weighing on me. When my brother died, I didn't just lose him. I lost a big part of my mother, too. That's lovely. Um, very powerful. Uh, I like the way you d describe the unfolding of the accident. It, I felt like I was right in the car with you, experiencing that. Um, and then it seemed like you take it in, in the middle of the piece in this new direction where it sort of the the story uh, sort of elevates to this new level where you begin reflecting on family. Do you want to talk about how you how you developed the piece? Was that something that you were consciously working towards? I wasn't. Um, I I don't know um, that I developed it, but I know that I tried to save 
the main point of what has hunted me from that accident. I regretted and I felt guilty the whole time of not thinking of my kids in that moment. And that's what brought this piece to, this piece to life. That's what made me write it. But I didn't want to include that in, in the, the prose because after you probably, after you read that I took my kids to school, the reader would probably realize that that's something that's part of it. Mm. I didn't want to mention it. I don't know if, uh, if that is a good choice or not, but for now, I think um, it works. And, and the, the thinking of the brother was i'm i'm assuming that that uh, was part of that experience right yes i um i was shocked when i was playing back what happened when i gathered you know myself because it was quite shocking i went to work that day i didn't say anything to any of my coworkers. i didn't file a police report i called someone and they um, picked up my car and and got rid of it and i went shopping with my father and my son and bought a new car um, soon after that. But when I went home, they couldn't believe the details of the accident. I um, was in shock because I would have never thought until facing that moment that I would have been happy in that moment. And I was so complete feeling so happy that I was going to see my brother. And what it made me realize was that we don't come close to believing and having faith in the eternal life until we face a moment like that. It seems to me like this scene that you've described is just a perfect, uh, perfect scene to capture in a flash fiction or nonfiction, right? Like at least I guess everyone has their different definitions of flash fiction, but my, my sense of it is, uh, I take the word on its face, a flash, like it's it's a light bulb flash or a spotlight flash, like where something kind of opens up in your experience suddenly and um, and often accompanied by whether it's an epiphany or some kind of insight or something meaningful or momentous happens in this little slice of a person's life, right? Yes, I agree. And I think that there is elements in there um, – that are used as literary devices, a metaphor or a comparison or things um, that may not be part of the reality and may be part of more, more fictional, but they are reflecting on um, the prompts on, on what um, really happened on the, the reality of that moment. Do you find sometimes you, you'll start writing a piece in prose like this, a short flash-oriented piece, but and then sometimes it finds its way into a poem? And if so, how do you know it wants to be a poem versus a prose piece? I feel that, yes, I do. And I, I feel that it would end up being a poem from the beginning with this piece. Um, I think this is probably going to end up being part of a, a series of flash uh, non-fiction pieces that are related to one another from that time period um, about 10 years ago 12 years ago but the the tone and um, how much of the lyricism which is a uh, characteristic that I don't pick and choose but it just it's the way that I write I prefer unknowingly and voluntarily it comes out that way by the amount of um, how lyric um, a piece is when it when it's written i then know that i would need to you know turn it into a poem well i wish you great success with this style i think you're good at it so have you considered submitting any of this work to magazine? i have submitted twice um i do like brevity because they do focus and actually that was um, a book from dinty moore which is the editor and um, of the book as well, and and Brevity Literary uh, website and magazine, I think it's in print as well, that um, I've submitted twice, but um, I was not accepted. And I do need to um, 
put a few other new pieces together and send them out. At this in this semester, I'm actually taking a class in publishing with um, Professor Guzman, and that is also helpful in learning about the publishing field and how to approach it better. Yes, yeah, um, I'm certainly keep keep uh, keep the faith and keep sending stuff out. Brevity, by the way, is an excellent site. And Dinty Moore was a former visiting writer at Widener uh, several years back. It might have been before you were here, but he uh, he, came, he came to Widener and we had him read and he taught classes and so forth. Espresso, thanks for joining us. We want to have you back on a podcast soon. Something I ask everybody who comes on. You were not prepared for this, but what have you been reading lately? Have you been reading any good books or is it, what's on your nightstand? I have been reading Freud. I wow. haven't read Freud since when I was, I think, right after high school. So that's what I'm reading right now. Um, which which work by Freud have you been reading? I have um, a moment. I'm reading the, I started with the outline of psychoanalysis mm -hmm. and it's fascinating. It's a, a one day read, but I just started it yesterday. And I do have a book that's assigned for class that I can't wait to read. I've uh, read great things about it. It's um, titled When Breath Becomes Air. This is for my seniors, English senior seminar class that I'm taking, but that's my um, next reading project. Hmm. Excellent. It's always great to get recommendations and, and kind of hear what people are have been up to lately. Let's enjoy your, you know, Freud's written a lot of interesting stuff. And uh, I do think he's a good writer. Like he has, like he's, I'm not a psychologist by training or anything like that. But when I do read Freud, I've, I find him accessible and fascinating, even when I don't agree with him. <laughs> 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 I haven't um, disagreed with anything so far. I've gone um, probably I've read to midway of the book, but um, it's I find it very interesting and fascinating so far. Great. Well, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing your flash nonfiction piece with us, and uh, we'll try to get you back on the show soon. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. The English Suite podcast is produced and directed by Jim Ash, with assistance from Sianna Bowers, Chloe DeFlumery, and Matt Lomas. Music for this episode was recorded by Jim Ash and Stacey Ash. You can find and subscribe to the podcast at anchor.fm, the Widener English YouTube channel, or your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening.